Good morning, or I think it is a good afternoon for everybody in New Zealand who is joining us as well. Thank you so much for rocking up to this webinar today. We have got a awesome panel discussion ahead of us if the conversation in the green room is anything to go by. Today we're going to be talking about understanding social audiences, what social means in times of crisis and how to make sure that you're getting that measurement right so that you can share that with your organisation. I'm going to do just a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the panel discussion. So if you are joining today and you have a question up your sleeve for one of our panellists that is fantastic. You won't be able to unmute your microphone and ask that. We'll keep everybody's mic on mute today just to limit any background noise that might come through. So the best place to leave that question is to look for the question mark icon over on the right hand side of your screen and enter that into the questions area. There's also a chat area there as well. So questions there, we'll have time at the end for audience questions because we have such an awesome guest gathering of panellists with us today. So I wanted to introduce you to those faces that you will be hearing from. If I haven't met you before, my name is Ali Garrett and I am the CX Director at Icentia. But who I have with me today is we've got Taylor Blackburn. So Taylor Blackburn is the Head of Public Relations at ANZ at Finder. And Taylor is a multi award winning communications specialist. I think that I could almost just not say award winning when I'm introducing everybody today because everybody's bios is award winning digital campaigner, award winning communications specialist. So it's so awesome to have such a, so, so much intelligence and experience on this panel today. And so Taylor's work has had a focus on personal finance and insurance since 2018. And Taylor, if you're thinking he looks familiar, that might be because he regularly appears on national media like Sunrise <laughs> and A Current Affair, and he's previously represented major brands and causes, so things like Breast Cancer Australia, Ford and Toyota. So good morning, Taylor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning. Awesome. We also have Jake Stedman with us today. And Jake Stedman is the VP of Research and Insight for Access Intelligence. And Jake's speciality is around building out and leading insight teams that then really drive growth in the tech space. So prior to Access Intelligence, Jake has built and led the research and insight teams at places like Twitter and Deliveroo. And he's also spent a little bit of time on the agency side at places like Kantar. So good morning or good evening, Jake, might be more appropriate for you because you're joining us from London today. Hello, nice to meet you. Hello. Awesome. And I just wanted to add as well that it's fabulous to have Jake here and be having this kind of conversation because we are starting to have different types of conversations like this one at Icentia with being acquired by Access Intelligence and thinking about those social audience tools that will be available to everybody from early next year. So thank you for joining us, Jake. We also have Meg Rayner with us today. And Meg is another award winner. So Meg is a dedicated award winning comms professional uh, and corporate affairs as well with a passion for crisis management and media relations. She's got more than 15 years worth of experience in that communications world but also journalism. So she's had roles at Fairfax and Channel 7 before totally switching gears to work in comms with the Metropolitan Fire Brigade and Coles. And in the last two years Meg has led that Coles media response to things like needles and strawberries, the bushfires of 2019 and 2020, and COVID. So good morning, Meg. I'm surprised you even have a minute to spend with us. <laughs> such a busy schedule. Always for us, Cynthia. Happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you. And rounding out the panel today, we have Alex Spence, another award-winning digital manager for the New Zealand Olympic Committee. And Alex has a really cool history of working in this social space. So previously, she's been the media manager for Netball New Zealand and took on that role of creating their social presence right when Facebook was launched. And the work that Alex does with Team New Zealand has been recognised as a world-leading National Olympic Committee for the work that they do 
in that social and digital space. And they were the number one National Olympic Committee for engagement following Rio. And so Alex is going to join us today to talk about some of her passion in this social space and for digital online storytelling. So good morning or good afternoon, Alex, because you're joining us from New Zealand today and we're so happy to have you join us. So welcome everybody. And Alex, I wanted to ask my first question to you. So when you are working on something that affects as many people or is as big as the Olympic Games or something like the New Zealand team, how do you define your audiences? Like you're, you're talking to everybody, your team New Zealand. Are there audiences that need more attention than others? What does that look like for you? Yeah, definitely. You've almost um, hit the nail on the head because our vision as an organisation is to inspire pride and excellence in all New Zealanders, which when you're thinking about online is actually a huge audience to try and target. Um, so we uh, look at that task by breaking it down. Essentially, we work with a variety of external um, offline providers for audience insights. Um, as well as all of our online data. So we get all of that kind of information. And then from there, we've bracketed it down into about four key groups. Um, the first being is our Olympic fans. So those are the ones we get at Hello. Um, they are following everything. They have a huge identity with New Zealand and, um, and a really strong presence on our channels. Then we have our event followers. So those that jump on board for any kind of event, whether it be the Olympics, whether it be the Cricket World Cup, they are there, they're sport fans, um, and they also have a strong identity with New Zealand. Um, and then we have our two kind of growth markets. So we have our youth, 18 to 24 year olds, predominantly men that we're trying to target. This is all targets for pre-Tokyo, and I'm glad to say that we reached a lot of these, but um, the other one is diverse cultures. So for us, um, it used to be new New Zealanders, but we've changed it to diverse cultures because um, for us, a lot of those people that are new to New Zealand or, or have grown up in New Zealand, but are, uh, um, haven't really got that strong New Zealand identity, how do you connect them with the history of the, fir the silver fern and the history of the Olympic team? So I guess the main thing for us is trying to retain our Olympic fans, convert our event followers to Olympic fans, and at the same time, create content for the youth um, and for our diverse cultures that is not going to actually uh, put off our other followers as well. So that's the balance that we aim to do with defining in our audiences. Thank you. That's so fascinating thinking about how you split something so, so massive into something more targeted. Speaking of, of things that are massive, I was also thinking about um, Coles here, Meg, working on something like the Coles COVID response or even Christmas coming up. I, I can't think of brands that touch many more Australians every day or every week. What does understanding your audience look like for you? Uh Absolutely. We do 20 million transactions a week. Um, so that's a lot of um, customer contacts um, in store, online, in all of our different stores. Um, and we need to manage their experience uh, and make sure that we're delivering, um, you know, something that's going to make them want to come back. Um, so our social uh, platforms is actually managed by our marketing team because at the end of the day, Things like Facebook for us and Instagram are trade drivers. So we use those to promote brands and promote, um, you know, sometimes things like sustainability as well, because it is our ambition to be Australia's most sustainable supermarket. Um, but we would use those, those um, channels predominantly as a trade driver. Um, we do obviously have to have them fully resourced uh, to handle customer complaints and customer contacts. Um, and we have two contact centres that manage those for Coles um, and then Coles Online. Um, and they are obviously extremely busy as well. Um, but when you do have something like crisis, uh, like the bushfires, um, and then we rolled into COVID, um, we actually took that opportunity in the corporate affairs team to sort of take over the Twitter account. So previously that was owned by marketing 
thing and it was only ever used to respond to customer complaints. Uh, and we just felt that that was a channel that we could use as customer, as corporate affairs to engage with media. Um, that's where media goes for news. That's where news is. Twitter is more of a channel there. I'm never going to sell our new brand of potato chips on Twitter. It's just not how it works. It's not what people go on Twitter for. Um, but, um, you know, I can put up that stores are closed for X reason uh, and it's going to reach the people that it needs to reach. Um, so we've been trialling with that for the last sort of couple of years in terms of messaging for immediate response. So things that we need to get out there. Um, at the start, it was really interesting because everything I put up had to go through marketing. Um, and we've sort of just managed to convince them that we can own that message and we can own that channel successfully. Um, and that's been really exciting for us. So yeah, that's awesome. how we... Yeah, thank you for that insight and congratulations. It all sounds like you have been kicking goals with grabbing that channel as well. It's Jane very exciting. I was the ghost tweeter for the chief of the fire brigade, so it was kind of exciting. <laughs> so I know what I'm doing. I was the chief for a little while, so um, now I'm Coles. You're like, guys, I've got this. I'm the boss. I know what I'm up to. It's all good. If you're going to put something up that's controversial, you're literally telling people a story is closed for a serious reason. So I think they, they can trust us with that messaging. Yeah, if I was going to hand the keys to any team that would probably be thinking of everything, it'd probably be the corporate affairs team. Like they'd probably have their bases covered. Um, Jake, I wanted to throw the next question to you. So thinking about for anyone who is on the call today who may be earlier in their journey for understanding the audiences for their organisations. We've heard Alex talk about that segmentation and Meg talk about how that works at her organisation. What are the, the data points that you recommend that somebody really should be considering to begin understanding those audiences? Yeah, it's interesting. So as I'm a market researcher by training and I've been a buyer of market research for the last 20 odd years of my life, um, which makes me feel old. Um, and it's interesting because it's kind of evolved over those 20 years. So if you think about market research and how market researchers approach things like segmentation, um, you have things like demographics or attitude or behavioral ways of grouping customers into what should be proxies for um, affinities and like-minded groups. But what we now find with social and digital data is actually you don't need to think about demographics or about attitudinal because actually you have a huge data set out there which is near enough real time that is allowing us to really understand an audience based on affinities. So to answer your question directly, what, what I find really powerful is audience affinities as a way to segment a, a particular target group. And that from social means what are people talking about, what are they engaging with, who are they following, all of the kind of signals that we get from people is a much stronger indicator of a group of like-minded people and that allows us both to help our clients plan. So using that kind of insight, we can help clients understand what's the right kind of content, what's the right kind of campaigns, what's the right kind of channels, all the way down to really granular things like what's the right time of day to be executing campaigns, whether it's marketing or comms, or, and then post-campaign effectiveness work to help understand the impact it has with a particular group of people that ultimately drives real-world outcomes, whether it's sales or footfall or whatever the objectives of the campaign is. Awesome. And I wanted to talk to you today, Taylor, as well, because we were talking about the way that social audience data is used at Finder is a little bit different than what somebody else might do in a different organisation. Are you able to, to tell us and talk us through what you're doing with your consumer sentiment tracker and that, that monthly surveying that you're doing at Finder? Yeah. So, uh, you know, kind of to, to Jake's point, um, you know, understanding affinities and understanding sentiment when it comes to um, the, the broader Australian population is, is really key to what we do because, so taking a step back, we, we have about 2 million uh, Australians that visit the site every month. Um, and that's to compare everything from credit cards to crypto, to pet insurance, uh, to, uh, you know, shopping deals. So it, it, there's, it's a wide range of, of people that we're trying to understand. And, uh, and, and the best way to do that is to ask, you know, a certain set of questions, um, you know, month on month or uh, each quarter. Um, and then we also ask a fair, a fair few one-off questions that are, you know, about the season. So whether or not you plan to shop in store this year or, you know, versus online. So it, it's all really helpful information for, uh, for the media that we work with. Um, and, and also just to inform uh, you know, people who, who uh, you know, write the articles and, and create the products, um, 
you know, to what, what people are, are tuned in for. So uh, surprisingly on that, uh, about 17% of people say they will shop in store only this year. So we were joking before the call that uh, people are missing that Mariah Carey music. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a real thing. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the, the way we uh, tend to understand the audience is, um, you know, we, we, there, are, there are groupings and that sort of thing when we talk about, you know, who's, who's doing what um, from, a, from a marketing standpoint, but it's, it's very much a, uh, and, we, and we segment all of the gender and generation and, and that sort of thing, but we also do a whole lot of um, just, just overall, you know, how many people, you know, own Bitcoin in the country and, and you know, it's 18% of people own some kind of cryptocurrency. So Australia is one of the, out in the front, you know, in front there. So understanding our audiences there is, is much more of a, um, much more of a, of, of a survey play. And we also do that in, in brand space. Awesome. Meg, I can see you nodding. Was there anything that you wanted to add so about much sentiment crossover. tracking for you? Yeah. yeah. There's so much crossover because Finder put stuff out and then I get a call about it. So, it's just <laughs> <laughs> um, way more people are shopping in store than that, Taylor. So, that's no, uh, not it's... fully incorrect. No. Um, <laughs> no, well, only. Yeah. Only. People that won't shop online will only shop in store. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. No, that makes yeah, um, no, we do similar stuff. So we have Coal Circle. Um, we do a lot of customer insights where we ask customers all these sort of similar sorts of information and that guides us. Um, our press release this year that we put out for Christmas that talks about custom behaviours and stuff. That's all, it's all research that we've done with our customers that helps us actually package essentially what is a trade driving campaign for Christmas into a media story. Um, so that's the two sort of worlds combined in terms of marketing and, and corporate affairs for us. Like we can't do what we do in silos. Um, we, we have to use that information together for it to be meaningful um, and for people to be able to consume it and not just think we're ramming an ad down their throat. It's actually they understand like, oh, this is an interesting story um, because it's relatable. Awesome. I'm really um, interested in that idea of social audience intelligence as a way to guide what you're doing. So guide those strategy, the media campaigns that you're doing. And Alex, I wanted to ask you a little bit what your strategy has looked like around embracing some newer platforms or newer tools, particularly for that youth audience that you were talking about. So Instagram Reels and TikTok, has that been something that's been driven by what you know about your audience? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. For us, it was really a no-brainer to jump into um, the new technologies and the new platforms, um, especially with reels and tiktoks we know that meta i mean in new zealand just to for those that don't aren't aware facebook and twitter uh, sorry facebook and instagram are predominantly the ones that we use here followed by tiktok and twitter's more used for uh, media and for um and for opinion leaders but everyday new zealanders don't typically have the same kind of interaction with twitter as they do in australia and internationally um, so for us getting on board with TikTok and the creation of Reels, we know that for Instagram and Meta that anything that new that they put out, they're pushing, right? So at the moment with collaborations that are happening, we can create collaborations with our Reels. Um, they're pushing that because they want that to be seen by more people. So the quicker you can jump on these new trends, um, and you, that's the way that you can actually get that more engagement. And in terms of the audience side of things, yes, you can't get that much audience insight through tools for TikTok. But the great thing about TikTok is that they pretty much give you, uh, you know, a question and you can respond immediately. So you have all the comments there and they're like, oh, show me, you know, a sevens player. And so you respond with a sevens player. Or, for example, we had a guy respond to one of our weightlifters saying, hey, well, this guy's not that strong. And then we're like, well, actually, here he is lifting up a car. He is that strong. Um, so it's getting that audience in real life and responding to them. Um, I mean, we would love to have more audience breakdown from TikTok, but in, at the moment, it's not a thing. So we're just kind of following where they're going. And I've got someone built intern internally to tell me, okay, what's the trends? What are people following? Um, you know, connecting up with TikTok and with Instagram Direct to make sure we're staying on top of all those things. Awesome. Um 
I'm just listening to that and thinking about how busy you and your your team sound. <laughs> what did what did planning look like for the games for you? Like what did that process of planning out that content to your campaigns? Are you able to share a little bit of that with us? Yeah, of course. So it is pretty intense because we are a team of um, two people. So I'm the digital manager. Um, I have a, another person that works with me full time. And um, we do have a videographer, which is great. Um, and then during games time, we, we do get other people on board to help facilitate the collection. But then it's kind of myself and um, Zoe who actually disseminate, break that down and, and put it out. So it's not a big team. So planning is huge for us. Um, we have four different phases. We have always on, we have pre-games, games time and post games. And then we have our calendar based content that is, um, you know, your Mother's Day and everything like that, all broken down. We go out to all of the athletes, you know, saying these are the opportunities. We have an athlete collective. They come back and say, I want to be involved in this, this, this. And then we go out and collect that information. Um, but really the planning is a joint venture with our brand team as well to make sure that we're staying on brand. Um, and from the kind of storytelling that we create with them, we break it down even further into these kind of storytelling pillars just to help make sure we have a real kind of build towards the games and how the nation moves towards the games. Um, for example, we also do work for the, we work for the Commonwealth Games. So I don't have just the Winter Olympics coming up, I have the Commonwealth Games coming up in Birmingham. Um, and one of our pillars is fusion of difference um, to try obviously for that fourth uh, um, audience that we're trying to target and trying to think about ways now for what does fusion of difference look like online. So my team and I, my team, I say team of two, um, we <laughs> sit down and um, brainstorm together, you know, really creative ideas um, to try and tell that fusion of difference from a, uh, a bowler who might be 70 year I actually, that's quite discriminatory, but like, you know, a lot of our bowlers are older of age, but compared to like a 16 year old gymnast and what are the things that actually bind them together? Um, and there's some really neat kind of storytelling elements that we can tell. Um, the only thing is now you have to create long form, short form. You got to get some photos, you got to get, um, you know, a written piece so that it can work across all different channels. So that's become a really, really big thing for us is making sure every channel speaks to the right audience and getting the right content for that audience. And it's a lot of work, but it's fun. It does sound fun and like a, a lot of work. And if planning over here is one side of the coin, if we flip that coin, I'm thinking about what these social audiences or social platforms start to look like in times of crisis as well, or times when we need to be more reactive. Meg, would you be able to talk to us a, a little bit about what social is, what, what, what role does social play as part of your crisis comm strategy? Is it everything is on pause when a crisis hits or are there ways that you utilize the channels that you have? Yeah, I think a really good example of how we can utilise or um, think meaningfully about social media during a crisis, because COVID I think is sort of, I mean, a once in a lifetime thing, I hope. <laughs> Just hope I haven't jinxed it. Um, so let's think about more, say, like a code red, which is a recall for us. So we have a product recall. We manage an own brand product recall. Um, we manage the suite of everything from the press ad, which is done by marketing, to the media release, the Fazan's notifications, which is the Food Safety Australia New Zealand notification, EDMs to customers who've purchased the item on Coles Online, and an EDM to customers who've purchased the item and swiped their flybys card, either in store or online. Um, and we have to think about how we let our customers know that an item they've purchased um, could potentially pose a risk to them, whether it's something like a, an allergen that hasn't been declared, like a nut or a soy or whatever, um, whether it's a microbial contamination. Um, there's a lot of different reasons a product might be recalled. Um, and the majority of them, we wouldn't do social media because that's not the place for it. Um, and it becomes quite, um, people get really scared that it's something a lot bigger than it is. Whereas usually if it's a really big item, then we would, but a lot of the time it's very contained. It might be one state, it might be one thing, and it would only impact a very small you know, number of people in public. The time we changed all of that and we thought about how do we use social media meaningfully here is when we had a milk recall about two and a half years ago 
from Lactalis, who was a supplier, and they supplied to a number of brands. So it wasn't just Coles impacted, and it was a number of stores, and it was very confusing for customers because it's like this brand one liter, but same brand two liter, that one's fine. Like it was very confusing. Um, and so we thought, you know what, let's just let's get an image of every single item that is impacted and put it up and tell customers these are the ones. These are the dates, these are the areas they were sold. Anything else, look, if you're worried, come back, we'll give you a refund. But it was very much about how do we use these channels meaningfully to um, connect with customers during a time when they're quite scared. Um, and so that's something that we would come together with the marketing team to develop the messaging for social media, I wrote it originally, I'm quite a nerdy corporate affairs person. They're like, yeah, I ain't gonna work on Facebook. So they obviously softened that language because they're so attuned to that audience. So I think that having that connection with content and audience um, and owning those channels, I can be quite sharp and direct on Twitter. That's what people expect. On Facebook, you do need to tailor that. So it's great to be able to have that expertise within our teams to make sure that the, the content we're putting out there in terms of crisis is meaningful because the last thing you want to do is spook the horses. Mm, absolutely. Taylor, I'm curious how much of what, of what Meg was just saying resonates with you. So I know that we've talked about social as part of reputation, but in your uh, head of media relations role, where does social fit? Does that fit as part of your day to day or as part of an, another team? Yeah, so I mean, it's we're all kind of part of one, uh, you know, media and growth team that works kind of hand in glove. Um, I mean, I, I'm using media a lot more for, you know, for, for news and for, um, you know, seeing what different uh, journalists are writing on Twitter or what different broadcasters are, are, are putting out. Um, but, you know, that said, the, um, you know, we don't have a, a call center or anything like that. So if you've used, if you've used the site, you know, and it's and it's taking you through to a, to a different product, whether it's a you know a Kohl's credit card or a uh, you know it's a, whatever whatever it might be a, a broadband or um, uh, any you know, pet insurance, and and you have a, a bad experience with that. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of people that will then you know send the email through to the, you know the the PR email address. Um, and, and also people that uh, if they see an ad on TV that don't care for your ad will let you know that uh, that you're wasting their their, their viewing time. Um, so so there's a, there's a lot of um, kind of you know working with the team to not only understand you know what where the concerns are and, and how to do the correct amount of social listening. Um, you know when when to when to step in you know to Meg's point without um, making the situation worse. Um, but but also kind of you know figuring out that you know if, if one or two people are, are sending you a message that you know that there's probably quite a few others who are having the same feeling and 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 escalating it uh, as as needed. You get awesome. that spike. Thing. I'm getting that more and more with TikTok. I'll be on TikTok for just tragically personal use, and um, <laughs> I will see something. And I just, I just, I know, I know it's going to blow up. And like within like usually about 24, 36 hours, Yahoo's emailed me. So you yeah, have to, yeah. you have to consume media to be able to work in media effectively, even if it literally has nothing to do with your brand. The amount of right. nonsense that I see and consume on a daily basis, somehow it somehow loops back to me. I'm sure Jake, that's sort of the whole game, right? Like you, you can't be part of this without being fully like, entrenched yeah you have to be using every platform you know keeping up with every trend it, it's how we do our work isn't it yeah mm. what about yeah. you Alex do you have a a spidey sense when you're out there looking at all of those different platforms what does crisis look like for you in in your role well yes I mean for sure I think what, what everyone's saying is really important I mean I've been in the same position now for, for 10 years and seen the growth of these platforms um, so it becomes really kind of personal. To be honest, I would say that my team know quite a lot more about our audience um, at the moment from what analytics can give us because we've grown alongside them. Um, and it's more the, the social listening that I'm interested in is who's not following us, you know, and why. Um, but in terms of those that are following us, it, it is that personal connection. It's still social, right, in terms of your audience. So um, the other side of things, though, the the crisis side of it, um, 
I wouldn't necessarily say it was a crisis, but it was it was planning for things to to go um, either off or not. It was around uh, selection to Laurel Hubbard, our white transgender weightlifter. Um, we had a variety of scenarios in terms of whether she meddled at the games or whether she didn't meddle at the games, all the way through to planning for, you know, do we put up, you know, every medalist gets this, you know, design, uh, a, a tile, you know, do we celebrate her knowing that the fact that all of this um, negative stuff is, is going to come on all of our channels. Um, so for us, we had to take a real step back and actually start from the perspective of athlete welfare, you know, and what does she want, essentially, in terms of her online representation. Talk to us team psychologists as well in terms around how is this going to affect uh, the wider team and how do we communicate internally. Because what we got to in the point with our team is that we had a whole team that supported her. And when you've got a whole team of 200 athletes that are on board with your messaging, both offline and online, and understand the decisions you're making, um, it becomes a way, a really powerful online tool for, for support, essentially. So for us, it was really important to make sure everyone offline was on board, so that when, when we came um, to games time and we, we went through this, um, I would say Twitter was a completely different world. Um, to this, but in terms of our core platforms and our team platforms that we were utilizing, um, we were really, really uh, pleased with the, with the outcomes there in terms of the balance of commentary. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm, I'm really enjoying hearing these insights around planning. I'm also enjoying hearing the advice today to spend as much time on TikTok for personal use as possible. <laughs> so we've all got something useful to come away from the session with. Jake, I wanted to throw to you next because I know that Pulsar has done work with Twitter and you've been doing work around defining like what is it that makes a campaign successful? What is it, like what are the learnings from that that people attending the session today can put into their toolkit and and how how do you plan for that yeah so it, it kind of speaks to my first point but before i answer that i think it's useful to give a bit of context just around what makes great ads online yeah. actually this is talking to work i did pre pre um pulsar sorry um when i was at twitter with my twitter hat on so we used to do a <laughs> program of neuroscience work there where we, we what we were trying to understand is what are the building blocks of memory? How do you create ads that are going to be memorable, that are going to cut through in a timeline that is pretty fast moving, right? And full of information and images and things grabbing your attention. Whether you're talking about Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, it's the same, same basic principle. Uh, and so we did some work to try and understand, well, how do you create ads that cut through? And there were two building blocks that we found neurologically as being the kind of the elements that really help create memory. And they are um, a sense of um, personal relevance and a sense of emotional intensity. And if you think about your memories from your kind of your background from the childhood, you probably are going to think about situations that are relevant to you, obviously, and emotionally intense. The story when I used to give this presentation there, the story I used to tell was being dropped off at university for the first time when I was 18 and seeing my parents' car drive off into the dusk. And that's a moment and an image that is ingrained in my brain. Um, and it's for, for those reasons. And, and Actually, now when you bring that into to answering your question, it becomes about planning for that personal relevance in particular. Emotional intensity you can create through great quality ads, creativity, you know, all of those great things that as camp campaign professionals and advertisers, you know, that's that's what we do and that's what we're great at. But you, you know, it has to be personally relevant as well. And that's where planning and audience affinity is coming, because what you have to do is make sure that you you are delivering the right content to the right people at the right time and in the right place. So all the work we've done with Twitter, we've been analysing over 40 of their campaigns um, at a brand level and a campaign level to understand what makes campaigns successful. Uh, and we define success based on that particular campaign and that campaign's objectives. And what we find is they're all campaigns that have that planning up front that helps people understand what is the audience and what can we learn about the audience we're going to target. Then importantly, how can we, what, what is the structure of that audience? And then finally, how do we execute and how do we plan and how do we buy ultimately against the audience? And if, as long as you have a clear line of sight between those three things, I think that's a really good recipe for making sure that your campaign is gonna have a success. Awesome. I wanna keep talking about success a little bit. And what does success look like in, in different organizations? Alex, what does, what does success look like for you? And then how do you share that with your organization? 
I think for us, it's um, for us, success is about moving um, basically those top line audience objectives that we've got and also our brand affinity. Um, it's sometimes it's easier to capture that offline. For example, I was talking about the diverse cultures, it's not available yet for that kind of depth of um, insight. Um, but for us, it's it's making sure that everything we do is actually speaking back to that inspiring pride and excellence in New Zealanders. Um, so success is not going viral. Um, it's because if you go viral, but you're not actually delivering on your purpose, you know, what is actually the point? Um, so for us, it's making sure that we do measure and making sure that we do kind of move that needle. Um, for me personally, I measure, we measure ourselves up against other NOCs um, because it's really, apart from brands like the All Blacks, but who are more international brands, um, it's something that we can actually like quantifiably show how we're tracking, what we're doing, how engaged our athletes are, which is another big success factor for us. We track, you know, we had 99% engagement for our athletes in our campaign as well as our sports. Um, so those are all different types of success trackers. But um, how do we measure and make it ta more tangible? Um, so in terms of presenting everything back, we all come together from an organisation. We get all the athlete feedback in. We get all the um, data that comes from all from our social media channels. We could definitely do more with social listening instead of social um, analytics. Um, that we're, we're trying to get more into that space. But in terms of all of that data, pulling it all together and working together to actually say, okay, you know, how much did we move this? Why not? All of those kind of basic things that you think is easy in an organisation, but when you've got so much data from so many different points of view and different people, it's, um, yeah, it's... I'm just trying to say, yeah, it's something that is complicated, but actually when you do get it together, it's really about just meeting those those top um, objectives that you're trying to get. What does that look like for you, Meg? Like, what? how do you define success in these spaces and how do you report yeah. on that? I mean, so at Coles, really, our True North is our net promoter score. Mm -hmm. um, and we look at measuring our net promoter score against other competitors. Um, and that's that's largely done by our marketing team um, and they use um, competitor tools to ICNTR. So they are using different measuring tools to try and get that data and do social listening. Um, our team in corporate affairs, um, we use our, our news of the day reports and our media monitoring coverage to determine um, how much positive coverage we're getting on certain campaigns or certain events, um, what the engagement is, how, and we measure all of that throughout the year um, and have KPIs in terms of how much positive media we want to get. Um, thankfully, you can't manage mine because my job well done is that you never actually see it happening. So <laughs> I'm on the dark art side of thing, um, which is always um, fun when it talks about measurement. But um, I think for the for the team that's working on sort of our consumer PR, um, we want to get more stories every Christmas than the Christmas before. We want to get more second bite stories. We want to get more sustainability together to zero, better together messaging out there. Like, is it meaningful? Is it different? Is it just syndicated? Like breaking it down like that and using Icentia to, to help us do that um, is, is what we do um, day to day, weekly, monthly, yearly. Um, we look at, I mean, how our team is actually having an impact because there's no point pitching and shouting into the wind. If the only coverage you're getting is National Tribune and Mirage News. Like we all know that's nonsense. So we want to get real coverage, right? So we want to make sure people are reading what we're putting out there. Um, and that it is it is organically spreading as well. So um, we have been getting more and more into looking at, okay, so something's run on Channel 7 News, have they also put it on Facebook? What are the comments on the Facebook? Like, what are people actually thinking? So we've not had, I feel bad now listening to Alex's resources because I feel like our team's under-resourced, but um, there's only seven in the Coles Corporate Affairs media team, which considering what we do every day is mental. So um, we do a lot of that sort of breakdown and seeing what actually is cutting through. Awesome. I want to keep talking about, about cut through because 
we have so many people here that are working so hard in something that it, it can be difficult to make tangible to an organisation that might not necessarily get what you're doing or get the dark arts. Taylor, I wanted to um, swing back to your consumer sentiment tracker and how you implement that. So how does that change the way that you go about your day to day? How does it change the way that you engage with media? I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, first off, shots fired at Mirage News. I mean, what did they do to you? Oh, come on. <laughs> what kidding. about you, PR agencies that threw in the clip uh, recently saying they'd landed yeah. coverage on Mirage News? And I was like, uh uh, uh no yeah, stride. Yeah, yeah. Um, no. I'm sorry, Alec. Um, yeah, so, no worries. I was just checking the attendees. Is there anyone from Mirage News here? What am I yeah. going to have to do? Oh, it's yeah. for an outlet. Yeah. It just scrapes media press release and puts it online. It's not real. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that isn't. Um, no, I mean for for us, how, how we use the CST to get cut through was that the question? Yeah, absolutely. How uh, do you make that real? Yeah, well, so, I mean, so I mean, I, I often tell you know other friends who who work in communication that it's a you know I, I'm kind of in a privileged spot because. Our whole mission is to help people make better financial decisions. And we do, you know, we compare 50 different, uh, we call them niches, but different like product areas. Um, and we have like 1500 guides that are not, you know, revenue based things that just are educational. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really all, all the stuff that we're doing is to help better understand the consumer, uh, for both for media and for you know partners that are trying to speak to the consumer so it's it's less of a like hey you know come come buy my car kind of thing um and more of a you know can we you know and, and i used to do that kind of uh, media early in my career uh, which which was also you know interesting but it's it's just a different it's a different thing so using using the um you know the sentiment of I mean, and we cut, we can cut things from like, you know, are you like who your telco provider is versus a question like, are you happy? Um, and, and, you know, tell, tell stories like, like that, you know, where, where are you actually, you know, Meg, back to you, you know, where do you primarily shop for your groceries? Um, so, and, and everything is, is nap rep. So, and it's, it's pretty, pretty spot on when, when you see ABS data come out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're we're using that information ultimately to to drive uh, you know more decisions and and more like personalized decisions. So um, we've got a we've got an app now that can connect to uh, your you know your bank account or your credit card or whatever to kind of analyze. Okay, well you spent you know ninety dollars on broadband, but you know you actually could be getting a better deal you know for that plan uh, here. So. You know, the, the idea for us is to just go go further with uh, more more personalized decision because you know there's not like one best credit card or one best pet insurance or whatever it's it all it's all dependent on your situation awesome and I wanted to get your thoughts both Taylor and then I'll, I'll throw over to you Meg as well when you are looking at social in an organization and when that forms part of your sentiment tracking who owns mm. that which which department in an organization <laughs> should be owning that i'll you first taylor and then hand over to Beck as well well it depends on how successful it is because uh, there's a lot of owners when it's, when it's going really well if there's any issues with it then there's um, no i'm kidding but uh we've got a uh, we've got an insights team um, that, that, you know, we've really um, worked hard over the last three years to kind of integrate into everything we do from, you know, the, from the questions we ask to how we analyze them. Um, and, and so, um, you know, having, having people with their, their fingers on the, the pulse and, you know, that are monitoring whenever there's a change in, in sentiment, um, you know, helps, helps people that are directly in touch with media tell those stories. And also, you know, if we, we get a we get a bit of a data that seems off, you know, trying to understand why that would be the case, or is this you know a huge trend that's about to happen? Um, so yeah, I mean, for for us, it's I mean, we would we'd say it's it's it sits with the the data team, but um, yeah, everyone is is equally across it. 
Yeah, our customer insights team sits within marketing and because the majority of our channels are trade drivers and the comments and contacts are managed by customer care, they sit within marketing as well. Um, that all sits within them. Um, when I get a positive tweet, I share it by email. <laughs> but there's no <laughs> nothing much deeper than that. Um, at this stage. I mean, we're just sort of playing. I mean, we're just sort of playing with the channel and seeing really what works. Awesome. What yeah. about you, Alex? Who going who, to the TikTok at the sorry, moment? Sorry, please so finish. As well, so we'll see what happens when we play on that channel. <laughs> um, yeah. So we're we're in a kind of different world, I guess, in the sense that we're not really selling anything. We're selling inspiration. Um, so our kind of my uh, team, we sit within the communications team, um, but more and more so, we are working with brand, obviously, in our commercial team. We've got to work with our sponsors, getting sponsor content that is um, engaging and authentic to both parties, ourselves and our sponsors, um, is super important. So we're actually merging a lot more in with that team, but at the moment, it sits within um, the communications department. Awesome. Thank you for running into that. We're heading into the last 15 minutes of the session today. So now is an excellent time to put any questions that you might have into the question area. So you should be looking for a question mark icon and popping your questions in there. We've got a really excellent question in there from Rebecca. And Rebecca has pointed out that a lot of what we've been talking about today, it's based on really big audiences or global audiences. And Rebecca's asked, does anyone here have any tips for translating some of these tactics to smaller regional audiences or lesser known brands? So Alex, I might throw to you first if there's anything relevant from your time yeah. at Netball. And Meg, I'll then ask you the same question, particularly with some of your work at the Fire Brigade. Um, yeah, I think for the small small businesses obviously you've got your core communities and you've got your, your your niche audiences but to actually start to grow you really need to get on board with trying to find ways um, or explore how those particular audiences um, utilize these new trends such as reels and, and TikToks etc because um, those are the places where you're going to get growth and you can actually jump on board with a groundswell of what's happening. If you can apply your messaging and your brand and take that and put it into something that's trending, you're going to get a lot of growth through that because you're going to be then aligned with you know everything else that's happening in that space, whether it's a trending song, whether it's um, you know uh, my business from here to there and how your journey of your business has been using the trends that are given to you through these platforms. So I think yeah jumping on those is really important as well as actually just having doing a full audit um, which we do all the time and which I talk to my um, in our sporting organizations around what you actually have so doing a full content audit whether it be you know do you know the history of your organization because that can be turned into content um, the events that you run how do you do that and actually breaking down all those different things that you potentially might already have um, that you can turn into content because a lot of the time it's around oh how do I make content how do I pull this out of thin air you don't necessarily have to start there if you're a small um, business or a small organization because there probably is a lot more in your arsenal than you realize yeah yeah we um, I ran the first um, fire safety campaign on social media for the Metropolitan Fire Brigade here in Melbourne. Um, we had extremely small audience numbers at the time like we were talking sort of tens of thousands like very small um, and the majority of people who follow the fire brigade were firefighters. Um, so the people we wanted to try and engage with um, was actually we wanted to not just create content but we wanted to make something that was going to actually impact and help solve a problem. So I think that that was something that I would recommend is, is look for, okay, well, who's your audience and how can you solve a problem for them? Um, and for us, what we ended up doing was targeting people who were sort of 18 to early 30s who could not care less about fire safety, like that's a mum and dad issue, but actually it does impact them. And if you're leaving your laptop on your bed, then that's gonna cause X number of house fires a year. So we were like, how can we be creative with this? We created a campaign called the Safe Mistakes Zone, which was all about the safe mistakes and then the unsafe mistakes people make. Um, and we used the channels to our advantage. Like we started a Snapchat account. We took people's names and we put them in advertising. Like it was just, it was really fun and it engaged a lot of people and that, you know, ended up getting um, a reduction in the number of house fires. Um, 
which were caused by these sort of like mistakes at home that you don't even think could could cause something as drastic as what we were looking into. So if you've got an audience that's younger, maybe look at how do how we solve a problem for them and how do we use channels they're already using and are engaged with and make sure your messaging suits that. If we'd done boring fire brigade messaging, it wouldn't have cut through, right? Everyone thinks fire brigade red. Um, we did everything green. So try and you know flip the switch and do something that's unexpected on your channel because that's going to probably engage more with a, a different audience than you than your, your usual audience. Awesome. Yeah, and, and, oh, sorry. I, I was just going to add add to that. I mean, for for a lot of the the, the surveys that we do, they, they're they're nationally representative, but we can split them down into that regional versus metro um, breakdown and the state by state breakdown. Um, and, and you can you can actually start to get you know, pretty granular, um, you know, until the the data is just too small to to matter. Um, but um, you know, we're also constantly looking at any of the um, suburb data when it comes to property or census data when it comes to, you know, whose uh, number of people who are single or, or, or that sort of thing and telling those stories by suburb, you know, the top suburbs in this area or the top suburbs in this area uh, for X, Y, Z. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you, utilizing utilizing government data is something that we do just as much as you know, our own, our own tools. Awesome, Sorry. thank you for adding that. No, go take. We've just no, got okay. so many questions coming in. People are so keen to hear from us. <laughs> I mean, very quick, so just to add to that, I think, you know, the same applies online as well, right? There's increasing kind of nicheification, if that's a word, of, of you know, social <laughs> and online conversation, right? Fandom is a term that we talk a lot about a lot at Pulsar at the moment, and that is just something that is growing. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that people in the right fandom, in the right tribe, want to have engagement from brands. The brands have a really important place to play in those conversations. It's just important that you find the right fandom and the right tribe to connect your brand to. And then, as Meg said, you make sure you've got the right tone of voice and the right content that suits that audience. Awesome. Speaking on content, we've got some questions that are along the lines of we're a really small team, we're not sure which platform to focus on, we don't have videographers, how do we recycle content, how do we reuse it? I might just do a quick round robin on that idea of low resources and recycling content with any any good advice. Starting with you, Alex, because I know you have to drop off for a, a briefing shortly. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is kind of our specialty because we only got a videographer for uh, Tokyo before that we, uh, little smartphone baby. No, we did actually use um, video companies for the big stuff, but I think don't underestimate what you can do on a smartphone. Um, there are so many apps out there in terms of what you can edit um, and, you know, apps like InShot where you can do pretty great stuff. You can utilise um, green screen, find a green wall. I do some work with the Mystics Netball team. We've got a green wall at our training center. Put them on front of there. You can get some really cool reels and information going. Um, and you can do all of that on your phone. Um, there's things that you can gadgets you can get for your cell phones as well. Um, courses as well to do online. There are short courses that um, my team member just did, both for design and for videographer and camera work. Um, because you just need a video camera and camera that can get some reasonably good content. These courses you can do in a day um, and they're not expensive and uh, they can tell you a lot of tips um, to be able to create that kind of content. And it's something that, you know, sometimes the best content is actually filmed from the perspective of the user, in our case, from an athlete on a smartphone. Um, and some of our most viral content has been from their perspective. Yeah, templates are really good too. If you find something that you can repurpose, um, then then setting up templates is something we used to do a lot in the Fire Brigade, a lot. Um, at Coles, we have sort of endless resources, so I'm probably not the best person to answer that. <laughs> That's a good point though, yeah. Templates, like we have a lot of um, PSD templates that we just take out, photos and imagery. It's a really good point. It's really key to have. If you just spend up front a cut like, you know, some money to get those done properly by a designer and then just have people that have basic skills to change out information. It's really great. Yeah, and I, I just, I'd add to that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so much data available um, that, you know, is being being created and, and, and put out there uh, that has not been analyzed in the way that you might be able to analyze it to speak to your audience. So, 
um, you know, whether it's something like retail data or property data or uh, grocery data, whatever, there, there's there's probably an angle of it that hasn't been told the way that you could tell it to, you know, to, to suit your, your needs. Yeah, I just add the, the data point is critical. Obviously, um, you know I'm drumming drumming the uh, the drum of fandom to yeah. so find your audience, but then also I'd, I'd give your login to the funniest member of the team. I think there's a lot to be said. <laughs> uh, funny, witty bit of content, give them kind of space and freedom to do it, and amazing the impact it has. And that that also will keep Meg busy in the uh, in the yeah. if they're if they're too funny. Yeah. <laughs> the other one as well is. Um, is on Instagram is, um, you know, if, if you've got some people, as Jake just said, about really funny people, do collaborations with them because then you get the stats that you get accrued from their own social media pages as well as your own. And then when you do that kind of collaboration, um, you can create some really authentic pieces of content and you pretty much haven't had to lift a finger. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask this question because it's so cheeky and I love it. I'm not sure if anyone wants to answer it, but Jake, I might go for some of your um, expertise in the area, if not. Most challenging experience with an influencer directed to any of the panel? Oh, we had a celebrity this year who wouldn't shave his beard and moustache to do Movember. Mm. He would have been really, really good, but he wouldn't yeah. shave and restart. <sighs> <laughs> That's the safest I can play. Yeah. Anything <laughs> else, or if we got zipped lips across the rest of the panel? Well, our influencers are our athletes, so I better keep my mouth shut. <laughs> well, there's also, well, okay, in all seriousness, if you've got an influencer that you've used for something and you haven't used them in a while, just go back and double check now and see what their position is on VAX and really quickly make sure you have a proactive statement. Because we used someone almost 12 months ago to promote a liquor brand who is now very anti-vax and I'm just going to say problematic. We were asked <laughs> yeah. about it by journalists and I was able to say we actually terminated their contract before they even posted any of this anti-vax stuff. We didn't drop them because they were anti-vax. They did a one campaign for us three weeks, six months ago. Um, so maybe just be mindful of that. That is maybe more constructive advice. <laughs> that is an excellent to do to take away. Jake, really quickly, like what do you know about influencer work based on the audience stuff that you do? Um, I mean, it's, it's really impactful, but I mean, it's stating the obvious, but it has to be the right influencer and in the right channel and the right content for the audience that you're targeting. So I think it goes back again to planning and having the right tools in place to make sure that you know who the right people are for your audience. Doesn't mean the biggest, most expensive influencers are the right people. There might be that niche influencer out there who maybe isn't even an influencer yet, right? Someone who's just doing great organic content around a topic that you feel like is relevant for your brand and you can build an influencer relationship with that person so um i think there's a you know influence is a really important tool for comms and marketers but you've got to make sure it's the right person awesome thank you jake we've got a couple of questions coming through that are around privacy and ethics that i just don't feel we've got enough time to do justice to in this session so jake and i might take that away and think about how we can answer some of those questions for you in future particularly with some legal implications and what that looks like around removing data so thank you for those questions i'm clocking them all jake and i will chat a little bit after this and we're probably heading towards the end of this session so if you have asked a question today we will be in touch later with some answers or some support for you and I just wanted to say thank you so much to all of our panelists today for joining us but also thank you to you we're so excited to be having these types of conversations we're really excited about the social audience tools that are going to be available to Icentia customers early in the new year and in the follow-up emails today you will also see we're launching a live survey that will help you understand where you are at and where your peers are at around their work in terms of how social is changing comms. So we'll send that through in the follow up today. We'll keep an eye on the questions that are coming through, but thank you everybody so much for joining us today. I have had an excellent discussion. So I hope everybody else enjoyed themselves as well and we will be in touch with more sessions like this one in the future. So thanks everybody and have an awesome rest of your day.
Thank you. Thanks, See you Bye. later. Bye.